Also, can I just give Kevin's full uh, introduction? He was also previously a member of parliament and a public servant and community activist. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora, Jennifer. Inga mana, inga reo, inga iwi o motu, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Um, it's great to be here. It's also kind of intimidating, despite what seems like a lifetime of talking at this kind of thing, to actually be amongst such an out outstanding range of presentations that we've heard today. And, and if there's anyone in the room that I feel sorry for, it is Jane and Tamatha, who somehow are going to need to actually pull this all together at the end of the day. Um, I've been at Forest and Bird for, for about four years now. Um, most New Zealanders would say, in fact, 90% of them regularly say in opinion polls, that nature is personally very important to them. Uh, and I think that, that gels with uh, the, the survey results that uh, Laura spoke to us about at the beginning of the day. So, so that's an extremely high rate. Um, but most people don't know that this thing that they love and really care about is actually in crisis. So we are the country in the world that has the highest rate of effectively native species. We are also the country in the world with the highest proportion of our native species at risk of or threatened with extinction. So we have more than 4,000 species that are at risk of or threatened with extinction. Actually, it's a lot more than that um, because there are very many species that we have never catalogued um, that are either um, at risk of or, or uh, threatened with extinction or have already become extinct. So why is that? Why are, those, why, why are those species at such risk? Well, one of the reasons is uh, in invasive pest species, both animal, animal and plant. Uh, a second reason is uh, that we, as human beings, are competing for the, for the same food sources or, or we are uh, directly killing the, the animals and plants um, that, uh, that, that are native to this place. Third reason is that uh, the habitats that our native species depend on um, are also the habitats that industry wants to be able to conduct farming and fishing and mining and forestry. So there's a direct conflict. And climate change, uh, as others have already said, and I'll try not to repeat what others have already said, exacerbates nearly all of those things. What I particularly want to talk about today is uh, habitat loss and degradation. Um, we at Forest and Bird released at the beginning of, of the year some, some information that had just come from Manaki Whenua that showed that nearly every type of uh, habitat uh, that native species relies on has been continuing to decline over the last five years. So you've probably heard the statistic that we've, um, we've lost 90% of our wetlands in the last five years. We continue to lose wetlands. And of course, that means we also continue to lose the species uh, that depend on them. So of those 4,000 species that are in decline, that includes 80% of our birds, for example. So Forest and Bird is part of an international coalition called BirdLife International. Colleagues from other countries might be saying, you know, things are terrible in Costa Rica. You know, 10% or 15% of our bird species are at risk of extinction. It's 80 for us, 90% of our seabirds, um, all of our frogs, and so on and so on. So this is, this is a crisis, and it's a crisis that is largely fuelled by the fact that we have set up an economy that extracts from nature... And I'm, I know that I'm echoing uh, Mike Trina, but I'm also, also echoing the Minister for the Environment, David Parker, because he includes the quote in every speech he gives about literally every topic. He quotes Herman Daly, the, uh, who's an um, ecological economist, who says um, that uh, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment, not the other way around. 
which is a neat way of pointing out that everything that happens in the economy has to happen within the confines of the, of the environment and the natural world. It can't exceed those boundaries. And yet uh, that is inconsistent with this paradigm of continual growth. Because if you grow and grow and grow and there are fixed boundaries, well, you start bumping up against them. And that's what's happening. So it's not just the environment um, that, uh, that is extracted from by the economy, because people are too. Uh, I'm, I, I'm maybe prefiguring the economic panel that's still to come. But the basic problem is that the, we have the relationship wrong between environment, economy, and society or people. We see the environment as the raw material inputs into the economy or its waste disposal system, and usually we see both of those as, as limitless as well, and people are the labour input in, into that economy. It's as if people and nature both have to serve the economy. But the economy is an entirely human-made construct. We have set it up to do a particular thing, which is to actually make a small group of people uh, consistently richer and richer. We can set it up to do something else. So why don't we instead say, what's... Uh, save your applause. There's, there's better still to come. You know, why don't we instead say, what are the social and environmental goals that are really important to people? Let's set up our economy to serve those needs instead. I'm, I'm conscious that, uh, that time is running out, so I'm seven minutes in. Oh, OK. Well, I'll, I'll claim more then. Um, so, so there's a bunch of things we have to do, right? Um, one of those is to, is to change the economy. And I want to channel my, uh, my friend and former colleague, Jeanette Fitzsimons, who made the really strong point that fundamental to making this change is the concept of enough. Rather than the, this perpetual growth, we all need to move into a space of recognising when we have enough. So that's crucial. Um, we need to transform industries. And I'm, I'm less cynical about the term just transition than, uh, than, than Mike, provided that the term isn't co-opted. You know, I've, I've, I'm from the actual coast, to tie a potany, where I've... Uh, where I've uh, spent decades uh, arguing with coal miners, even coal miners you know, understand that coal mining cannot continue. And I'm talking about the workers here, not the companies. Um, but they say, this is how we feed our families. So if we're not going to do coal mining, you tell us what we're going to do instead. And that's a reasonable challenge. So that's the process of just transition. We do not compromise on the change that we need to make for, for the environment's sake, but we ensure that the people who are most directly affected are brought along with us too, and they have better lives as a result. So that's, that's just transition. And what we need to work with industries, whether it's farming, fishing, mining, forestry. Imagine a bell curve. At one end of the curve, there are people who are genuinely doing innovative things. You know, the farmers who are on country calendar every week. Um, I don't know, don't know who's actually choosing the stories, but it's, it seems to be a particular subset of farmers. Um, so so there, there are innovators, and we need to help them and support them. At the other end of the spectrum, there's a bunch of, of people who we might describe as laggards, who do not wish to change anything that they do. For that group of people, we need a really strong regulatory framework um, and we need really strong enforcement, and forest and bird is often involved at that level. But most people are somewhere in the middle. So just transition is about the process of enabling that bulk of the bell curve to make the transition. And by, by taking that approach, you can make it go faster. There's a bunch of other things I could talk about, but I, what, I, what I particularly want to say is the tools to do these things are in our hands. You know, it's not someone else who needs, who needs to do this. 
we can make these changes. And I know that we sometimes look at the fact that, there, that we are relatively few and the challenge is huge. Today is 39 years since the pitch invasion at Hamilton Rugby Park. Um, on, if you go to my Facebook page, I'm so, sure you're all my Facebook friends, you'll see my... And if you're not, you know, please, you know... You'll see that my wall photo is, is a picture of the, of the bunch of us, uh, John Minto and I, standing arm in arm in the middle of, of that park. We achieved something amazing, you know, at that time. And yet, at the end of 1980, I vividly remember a picket of, I think, the rugby union. And at that point, they had already invited South Africa, apartheid South Africa, to come here. And I think we probably managed to, to muster maybe 20 people. And yet, uh, over, the, over the course of actually just you know, less than a year, we moved from that 20 people with not a lot of effect to hundreds of thousands of people being involved in a movement, a movement that actually helped achieve something really amazing. We need to turn that same energy, that same passion, um, to restoring our environment and creating just relationships between economy, people and planet. Thank you.